Hi, I'm Matt Archer. I'm with Aporia Magazine, and we are in Berkeley, California, at the world's most important conference on intelligence. And we wanted to ask the world's leading researchers two questions. Is there a question that you would love to have the answer to, that you, that you would die for? I don't know if I'd die, but I'd perhaps look myself rather unwell. And uh, this would be, I'm very interested in the idea that intelligence is negatively associated with instinct. And there's some evidence for this, that people that are uh, highly intelligent um, are more childlike, more environmentally plastic for longer. That they're more environmentally sensitive. Um, and therefore, in this sense, they're less instinctive, that there's less built into them. Um, and this would explain a lot of things, such as intelligent people becoming more dysphoric, being less likely to have children in evolutionary mismatches like modern society. So I don't know if I'd, if I'd die for it, but I'd be very interested to know the answer in more depth. Okay. Um, I want to know... Uh, okay, so I guess, like, I'm not totally sure about these super high IQ tests, uh, if they're nonsense or noise. Uh, anything above, like, 160, 170, the sample sizes are really small, so like, what does it even mean to say that Marilyn Vassalant has an IQ of like 230 or 240? Like, should we just say it's nonsense? I kind of want to know that. I can tell the difference between 140 and 160, because when you talk to people that are 160, and I'm not one of those, you could tell that they're smarter. But I don't know if I've ever met someone that's supposedly 180 or 200, and I don't know what that means, you know? Why do you think that's an important question? Uh, because, you know, it would be, if, if it mattered, if it was a real thing, they could be the innovators. They could be the creators of, you know, you know, creators and, and, and maintainers of civilization. Well, to me still, the, the most fundamental and interesting question is the degree to which social interventions change outcomes and the degree to which it's just all hardwired uh, when we're born. And that's been an eternal question. And it's amazing that uh, we still don't really have an answer to that. Why is that an important question? Um, because I think it determines a lot about how people think about society and think about ethics. Um, and as an example of this, my spouse defends people on death row. And interestingly, they spend a lot of their time trying to show that their client's behavior was actually hardwired. <laughs> uh, and so that there's, for a lot of ethical issues, it's actually going to be very important. But also now, we spend something like 10% of all income in modern society on education. We don't know how much of that is a pure waste of time and effort. And without an answer to some of these questions, you're not going to know what you should actually invest on as a society. And so I think in terms of uh, social investments and our thinking about what kind of society we want. So I would argue that determinism would actually argue for a much more equal society than the idea that it's all socially constructed. Uh, and so, so it has important implications for inequality, for expenditures, for how we organize uh, life. And so that's why I think it's, why it's the most fundamental of all questions. Yeah, the Flynn effect is the big conundrum. Um, what's behind the Flynn effect? How do we explain it? No explanation that's been offered so far is really convincing. Um, every, everything's got problems. Uh, there were talks at this conference on the Flynn effect, but um, it looks like nobody's made any real progress in a long time. It's called the Flynn effect, but it really should be called the Lynn effect, because he discovered it. And there were people before that who noticed it, but he was the, Flynn really was the first person to systematically investigate it, I think. Lynn noticed it, but Flynn really went after it. Uh, but then Flynn had at least five different explanations for what he thought was going on. So he couldn't really make his mind up about it either. And it's the big conundrum, um, understanding that. Um, I think a lot of the reasoning that's been built around it is fallacious. The idea that you can seize on that as a way to raise intelligence strikes me as grasping at straws. But we need to understand it, and, and we don't. So that, that is the big outstanding question. There are many others. The nature of G, are there really other factors? 
um, how convincing are those? But the Flynn effect's the big one for me. Hmm. I've tried and more recently to see if intelligence and creativity are related in a meaningful way in the brain. Um, I tried to dissociate these things from each other and I think I found some interesting dissociations. Uh, but uh, I, I guess the, the, the interesting thing would be, and this gets back to John Nash, our, uh, is intelligence more important to human flourishing or is creativity more important to human flourishing? What are the neural correlates of general intelligence? Why, why do you want that answer? Because general, we know general intelligence is predictive of so many positive life outcomes. And if we could understand that at a biological level, then we could open up the door for you know, uh, cognitive enhancement um, and en enhancing intelligence. One thing I would love to know is whether it might be possible that there's something about how the human brain works that uh, we'll never be able to understand. Uh, it might be, seem a little strange to be able to say in advance, well, could we ever know that there's a wall beyond which we can't progress any further. But there are similar kinds of things that arise in mathematics and computer science. Uh, various people, Gödel, Turing, have discovered things that are sort of like this. And it makes me wonder whether there might be something like that about um, uh, the way the brain works, the way the mind works. And, uh, and others, such as Douglas Hofstadter, have specifically speculated um, about uh, this very question. And Could that this is something I would like to know. What, what it, well, is it? Might it be or might it not be? Could that be consciousness itself? Um, could be related. Uh, it's hard to say because we don't really know what consciousness is. It's a very hard question to answer. Um, but yes, it's related, and some people have specifically wondered uh, uh, consciousness. Uh, it could be. Could that be one of those things that? Our mind has inherently, it's going to have a tough time wrapping itself around it. Well, I would, I would like to find out, uh, hear them talk more about the effects of non, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow, I know, uh, non-cognitive uh, mental abilities on intelligence, uh, personality ability, or personality traits, factors, and, and how they go to develop belief systems. A, little, a more holistic uh, look at things, you know, kind of a gestalt type of uh, uh, approach, which I haven't seen that uh, discussed here, and I've been to several of these. Yeah, I, I would love to have the answer to, um, I think, something that was raised in uh, a couple of the papers um, here at this conference, and that is, how do we actually use what we know about intelligence and in fact other individual differences to come up with ways to maximize students' ability to succeed in, in, in society. And so succeed in society going beyond school, for example, um, because there are some people who may go into um, building or other domains other than academic domains. And all of these things involve a combination of um, intelligence and a variety of other constructs, and we still don't know how they work well together. Why are there group differences? Yes. And that, that's a very controversial question. But, and my answer is I think the group differences are because of lack of opportunities. I hope I'm right. I don't know that. 